It's been a big year for Inglis, hosting the world's first virtual yearling sale and now set to hold the world's first live thoroughbred auction since the COVID shutdown. Plus, there's been huge interest in their now well-established monthly online sales, with the June digital sale highlighted by a wonderful draft of racehorses from Godolphin. Let's just reflect, I guess it is now two months since English Easter won. It was quite incredible, the reaction from around the world and, and you know, what a successful sale it was. How, how do you kind of look back on, on the first sale? Well, it was a challenging time for everybody, Caroline, and you were in the middle of it, of course, uh, helping with the coverage. But look, it's really the weeks leading up to uh, the Easter sale where we had to make a decision whether we could run with the sale or not, uh, under whatever conditions were, we would be, be permitted to run the sale. So we did have plan A, which is to run the sale with uh, restrictive numbers, with a biosecurity plan. Uh, but a week out from the sale, of course, the Prime Minister changed our world and tips up, tipped it upside down. And we weren't able to run a live sale. So, um, yeah, just thinking back, it, you know, it's quite incredible that we got through the sale. And I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, the industry that were able to uh, get behind a format for the sale that uh, was completely new. Uh, my team in particular that helped make it happen in a short period of time. Uh, so to have a, a sale that averaged over 300,000 in such challenging uh, times was, was, was incredible. And of course these are elite horses, but I mean there was so much confidence from the buying bench, wasn't there, really supporting the, the vendors that sold at Easter One? Yeah, look, the buyers had to do more work than normal. Obviously the horses were uh, you know, out on the farms around, all around Australia and you know, over in New Zealand. So it was really left to the buyers to get out and do some legwork. Uh, you know, we had people like Maria Yoshida who came out and put herself into self-isolation for two weeks and then had to drive herself around the Hunter Valley. Uh, and we're really thankful for all the buyers that have gone to that extra trouble uh, and they stayed committed to the sale. But equally with the vendors, you know, the vendors uh, had to change all of their practices and, and take a leap of faith in what we were doing here at Inglis, which was you know, initially going with a digital sale and as we got closer to uh, the timing of the sale, we, we thought we could push it a little bit further. If we weren't going into complete lockdown, we thought, well, maybe we could go from a digital into a virtual sale, which would mean we'd have to have English staff here and an auctioneer in the rostrum. Um, and we switched format right at the end. And I think that was the, the right call. I sell him out to Harry for 1.8 million. The level of engagement was significant. You know, 300 odd thousand people around the world dialing in a lot of, um, a lot of lovely notes and messages from people. But if we look at uh, the business that we're able to do for the vendors, we had 12 vendors were able to clear 100% of their draft under, you know, extreme conditions. Sejinho, Sledmere, uh, Kitchwin, Tyrell. I mean, they're four of the biggest studs that were able to clear 100%. So I congratulate all the vendors uh, for their results. Uh, that they were able to achieve in an average over 300,000. Uh, clearance rate close to 70%. Under the circumstances, uh, were good results. I sell him. Done. 1,400,000. Great to see the, the stud supporting it on the, the buying side as well. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at the buyer front. We certainly had the traditional buyers that would buy, you know, into the, the stallion syndicates, you know, the China Horse Club, as an example. You know, Coolmore were. Uh, the leading buyer across the board, buying Colts and Phillies, of course, and the leading vendor. Uh, so I certainly thank everyone at Coolmore and the syndicate they put together and Todd Magnia for, for being so supportive. You know, it was really great to see people really pitching in from within Australia supporting the sale. Yeah, we certainly did see that. I think Ozhorse normally do what we call sort of branding or, or umbrella marketing. Uh, but they played a really important role in promoting the sale around the world and no doubt helped uh, build the 300,000 viewers that we talked about. Andy Thompson, uh, obviously the principal there at Widden as well, did a, a really good job in the, in the week before the sale, uh, trying to comfort some of the vendors of, you know, when they were being approached by buyers. You know, there was some talk about selling off the farms and I know Andy Thompson did a great job in helping me sort of corral breeders to, to sit patiently uh, and wait for the uh, for the sale. I guess it was a tricky time for, for a lot of the vendors as well, trying to work out what suited their business model the best way to sell their yearlings. Yeah, that's right. Like in terms of the vendors leading up to the sale, that was the most challenging part for my team. We're constantly on the phone with vendors trying to understand uh, what they wanted, uh, getting their advice, trying to give them feedback. Uh, and there are some vendors who just 
said, well, we'll go with whatever you're doing. We have full confidence in you and we certainly appreciate that. There were some vendors that were in more re remote locations uh, that decided they were best to withdraw and either wait for round two, which we'll talk about in a minute, or in some cases sell off the farm. Uh, and of course, you know, a major vendor like Arrowfield, as an example, made a decision to uh, withdraw their draft and sell off the farm. You know, at the time, I wasn't very happy about that. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, everybody was going through a challenging period and people were concerned about, you know, whether we were going into a full lockdown, whether even horses could be inspected properly off the farms. So in the case of Arrowfield, you know, they've been a great customer for many, many years, selling, I think, at least 30 years at Easter and a very loyal client and we thank them for that over the years. I wish they were in the sale, they weren't, but uh, certainly I don't hold any grudges for the decisions they've made. And now we move on to Easter too. And, uh, you know, as I said, the world's first live thoroughbred sale again. Uh, you know, it's a bit of history here for Inglis, but tell me how that's going to work. So on July 5, you know, we're running a, a live sale here with Easter 2 kicking off and then the scone sale, which has been moved here in the afternoon. Inspections will start on the 2nd of July and, you know, they'll be relatively normal. But yes, we do have to operate under uh, restrictions, of course. Anyone who's feeling unwell won't be allowed on the grounds. People will need to register in advance and all that. The details around that will be made available in the, in the coming weeks. Working towards a capacity of 500 people outside and then 100 in each internal space. So it means say the sales or any of the horses will come in, they'll be presented on the stage as normal, but there'll only be 100 people on the sales uh, ring floor. There'll be people in the boxes above, but certainly the, the, our investment in the facilities will pay off. Uh, but the big barn that we have here, we're not stabling any horses in there, but that'll be another space where buyers can stay out of the cold weather uh, during the sale. There'll be no horses in there, but they'll be able to go and sit in there and watch on the screen and then just pop around and look at horses when they come in the back ring and, and, and bid from there. There's 94 and I think that's a fabulous number noting we've already offered 350 so you know and all up it's close on 450 that'll, that'll be offered which is on par with the year before. And they are the big gun stallions you know I think Frankel might be the, the sire with the biggest representation I think he has seven if not he'll be equal to some of the others. You know this is not some second cut it's not an old Easter book tour or anything this is, uh, you know, a draft of yearlings that would have been in the normal Easter sale. We're just calling it round two. We've had round one and there's going to be champions in there. You know, the, the Chautauquas of this world, the loving Gabbies, they will be uh, in this offering coming up. There'll be, you know, there'll obviously be horses of that quality uh, that we'll be selling. So people need to be here for that sale. And of course, if they then want to stay on and look at the scone level yearlings that are coming in that afternoon, then uh, they'll be able to do so. And of course, the other thing that's different here, it's a yearling sale, but there will be some yearlings that have been broken in. So an example, the yearlong draft, uh, I think they've all been broken in. So we'll make that information available to all the buyers. So if they want to save themselves a couple of thousand dollars and uh, six weeks uh, of time, they'll be able to do so. Natoya down the outside, swoops to the front in the Doncaster. You know, just the ongoing effect of the breed through these English sales too. You've got four Group 1 winning Colts in recent times and 41 stakes winning fillies and mares. That's exceptional for any sales company around the world. Firstly, you know, the vendors are giving us quality stock and in most cases their, their first pick uh, to sell every year. And I think our bloodstock team that are just outside this room you know, do an excellent job. They don't just go and look at the yearlings once and make a decision. They'll go back and look two or three times. You know, we're well in front in terms of the number of Group 1 winners that we're producing or stakes winners across the board or stakes fillies or Group 1 winning colts. Whatever metric you want to look at, we're in front and uh, thank the vendors for their support in that area. It's the Inglis Millennium, around almost $70,000 worth of that prize money, will count towards the Golden Slipper, getting into the Golden Slipper. The $2 million Inglis Millennium, you know, is an important race and we wanted it to be recognised as such. It's near on $70,000 for the, for the winner will count and hopefully that'll be enough to uh, just improve the quality of that uh, Millennium field over the future years. And of course, we're moving that race into Ramwick as well uh, from next year. We're introducing a new race, which will be the English bracelet uh, held on Oaks Day down in, in Melbourne during the spring carnival. A $250,000 race for fillies and mares, which is a completely new race that'll start this year. And the English Challenge is one of our most popular races. We're doubling the prize money from 100 to 200,000. Uh, for next year. July again is another big month so you know it's great to see so many people wanting to buy and sell horses right throughout this period. Yeah we joke about that here Caroline that you know we've not really gone into lockdown and you know, people aren't really working from home because it's just continued. You know we've sold more horses over the last two months than we did last year with uh, 
our digital assets that we have. And looking ahead in July, you know, it's such a busy month. We touched on Easter round two, the scone sale, which is being held in Sydney. We've got a weanling sale here in Sydney. We have a weanling sale in Melbourne. And then we have the gold yearling sale in Melbourne. So there's still a lot more horses to sell in July. Normally on, in July, we're all off on holiday somewhere, but it's a very busy month. And uh, uh, you know, business as usual, really, for the company, the industry in general. And I thank the racing authorities for keeping racing going, first of all. Uh, that certainly made our life a lot easier. And you know, just thank all the vendors and buyers that are out there around Australasia in particular that have continued to trade. You know, there's uh, perhaps a degree of boredom, people getting set, sick of uh, Netflix, uh, but they're getting in and they're, they're transacting online and having faith in the digital services that we offer and we thank them. Mm -hmm.